Um, looking forward to a great training today. Thanks. Take it away, Sean. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to part two. Glad to see um, so many of you were able to make it back. Uh, it's always, always um, a pleasure to spend some, some time with you. Uh, and Beth, I'll say it again. This is not goodbye, but it's see you later. Okay? It's not goodbye. We'll still see Beth out there in the world, in the universe, doing great things for our youngest citizens, young children, and their families, um, not just in Alam Alameda County, but, but across counties. And I, I, I'm speaking it across the country, even, so. To God, thank you. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to jump right in and we're going to talk about risk. Um, we're going to talk about um, this notion of identifying, assessing, and responding when uh, concerns related to those green, yellow, and red behavior surface. We're going to talk about some strategies. Um, we're going to juxtapose what it is around child versus adult sexuality and some distinctions so that we can ground ourselves in that. We're going to talk about some tips for reporting, and then we're going to end with what to teach, and then we're going to have some uh, some door prizes. So um, we will have um, uh, a breakout space. So for those who are on, uh, but we can't see you, as always, just a heads up so you can prep yourself. When we get to those breakout spaces, um, we need you to cut your camera on and your mic so that the folk who you're in that space with aren't looking at a black screen. Um, that creates issues of inequity online. So just for those who have the black screens now, you know, I can't see you and I'm, a, I'm fine with it, but definitely when we get to the breakout spaces, um, cut your cameras on and, and, and your audio to get ready for those um, scenarios. All right, so we're gonna jump right in. So I told you yesterday, we would start with a uh, potential risk. So we know that issues of se healthy sexual development, um, there can be ruptures for some children um, or what we like to name as risk, particularly children with disabilities. So children with disabilities are highly vulnerable to being taken advantage of by their peers, adolescents and adults. So across age spans. And oftentimes it happens in early learning settings or around other children their age uh, because we've included them, which is great, but developmentally, depending on their disability, if things are happening for other children and they don't know what those are, it sets them up to be taken advantage of. So as adults, it's our role and responsibility to always know that children with disabilities are oftentimes at risk for um, those things happening to them, all right? Um, we also know that children who've experienced abuse and neglect and I like to say big T and small T, those T stand for trauma, um, big trauma, small trauma, um, across that trauma continuum, because what may be a small T for me may be a big T for Beth. What may be a big T for Beth is a small T for me um, because it's highly individualized. But we need to really understand that when children experience ab abuse and neglect, it puts them at a higher risk in terms of when we think of healthy sexual development, that them not developing across that developmental domain the way other children within their age group um, are developing. So we need to pay attention to that also um, as a form of development. And we know that what puts children at risk is disruption, disruptions to their development or socialization. So you may be saying, Sean, what do you mean by disruption? So disruption to a three-year-old's development is I'm in the bed and I fall off the bed and break my arm. That's a disruption to my development. And we know that with young children, the body's now gonna what? Try to focus on healing my broken arm. So when it's focusing on healing my broken arm, another form of my development has to slow down so that my body can resource to heal those broken bones. And oftentimes when that happens, particularly for young children, two-year-olds and three-year-olds, where they're still developing lots of expressive language and learning new uh, words, if my language slows down, then that will what? Inhibit my ability to say, teacher Beth or mommy Leah, this thing happened to me. So we need to be highly, highly mindful of that and to resource so that if you know that happens, let's see if Sean can get some you know, additional speech and language supports 
while his arm is healing and it affects my socialization. If I can't what play the way the rest of the kids are playing, I'm at school with a broken arm or a broken leg. Um, so I'm sitting most of the time, even when we're outside, hires the teachers and the adults. If I'm at a family childcare home, if I'm in the after school program, if I'm at my babysitters, or if I'm just with my abuelita at her house and that's who watches me while my parents you know, do their thing. Or maybe it's my mom or my aunt watching me and my other cousins are there. How are we all paying attention to my development and the socialization that I'm receiving or not receiving or potentially being um, taken advantage of? So that's a, that's a risk that we have to pay attention to. And the other one is, and we mentioned this a little bit yesterday, this notion of um, children who demonstrate inappropriate sexual behaviors, they oftentimes have had exposure to certain things, certain people in certain places. Um, and some of them, their families and parents simply are not aware of. They, they, just, they just aren't. And I named some of those yesterday, but those put children at risk because oftentimes we're asking children to be silent about it. Um, as a mental health consultant in Alameda County, literally I had children who had press play on the VCR and, and watched adult videos and started acting out and no adult knew until you know, those, those behaviors showed up outside of the home. I had another child who went on vacation and ended up seeing two adults engaged in sexual activity. No one knew until the child what, came back home and started acting out. Um, so this exposure to not just those types of acts, but it could be literature, it could be television programs, things on YouTube, on their tablet, on their cell phone, or just conversations that we are having around or near children and they're listening quietly and trying to pick up on what it is that we're talking about um, can put children at risk as they attempt to make sense of the inappropriate exposure. So let's be mindful of, 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 of those risks also. So there's some steps that we can follow. If we think about yesterday and how we talked about the development the appropriate nature um, of healthy sexual development for young children and those areas um, in the green that are very healthy and we want children to experience them in, in a very age appropriate way. Uh, but then there's some things of caution in the yellow and some bright red flags in the red. Um, so we're gonna talk now and around like this notion of identifying, assessing and responding. Remember this word assess is not synonymous here with diagnose. So let's be really clear. I want us to be really clear that the word assess on the screen does not mean you are diagnosing a circumstance or situation. That's not what it is, all right? It does not mean we're becoming the inspector gadget to like get to the end of it. It's someone else's role and responsibility and they have that title. So I, I can't say that enough. Um, so we wanna follow the steps of identifying and assessing and responding so that as an adult, we know how to intentionally engage the child or children who are demonstrating these sexualized behaviors or sexual behaviors or even questions or curiosities because across that continuum, we should have an appropriate, a developmentally appropriate response. And that's one of the big pieces that I hope as a result of our time together yesterday and today that you'll have in your toolbox some more developmentally appropriate responses to things as simple as curious questions, play behaviors, uh, things that children are trying to figure out that are issues of caution and even issues of red flags in that we definitely don't see all three as the same. So that, that's my big hope for everyone. So let's start with identify, identify. So we start with identify by saying, what is the behavior? What is the behavior? So when we say, what is the behavior? We're going back to those green behaviors that are developmentally appropriate. We keep watching though, those yellow behaviors which are of caution, they're of caution. We need to be mindful and cautious of those in those red behaviors. So we start there. And then we consider what the social context, how is this child socialized? Where does this child, you know, where are they when they're not here? Are they with their parents and families all the time? Are they with, you know, are they at a Head Start program and then at a daycare afterwards? And then they at another provider on Saturdays because their families just works almost 20 hours a day. So they spend most of their time with three different or four or five different adults. All of those pieces are important. What are the cultural pieces 
that show up in this behavior? You know, do they have a very sex positive family that's talked to them about sexual development since they could see and walk? Or do they come from a family that's not very, um, uh, what we call sex positive, meaning none of those things are named, talked about, um, and is frowned upon, or even you're punished for bringing up those pieces. All of that's important to a child's behavior and our response. So we start with what is the behavior and what category does it fall in to help me then do what? Assess, so I know what next to do. We, we often say in early childhood, all behavior has communication. And I, I often tell people, we need to be saying that as a life course piece, that all behavior has communication. So for those of you who work with or supervise adults, you know that all behavior has communication. Um, so we go through that and say, okay, the child's demonstrating this behavior. So let's say Sean is demonstrating the behavior. Sean is wanting to kiss lots of people. He's coming in and he's, you know, wanting to kiss the adults, the teachers. He's wanting to kiss the peers. He even wanted to kiss the person who brought in the pet visitor. He wanted to, he wanted to kiss them. He has no respect to person around who he wants to kiss. I've identified that behavior. So what is the behavior communicating that Sean wants to kiss everyone? You know, I need to go back to what are the developmentally appropriate behaviors? What are the behaviors of concern and what are the red flags? We would definitely say this is what? A developmentally appropriate behavior, a concern behavior, or a red flag behavior. It's definitely a behavior of concern, right? We, we wanna watch this because maybe Sean just hasn't figured out yet what boundaries are in that he comes from a family where he kisses his grandma, his grandpa, his tias, you know, his parents, his families, his cousins, and he really has it picked up on. That only happens with familiar people within our family, but we shouldn't do that outside and no one's told him that. It could be as simple as that, or that concern could turn into a red flag, all right? So that's why we have to see the behavior as communication um, and do some more things around assessing. Does Sean have the language, the words to say, this is why I like to kiss people? What are my limited or expansive experiences? For what? Saying, Miss Beth, this is why I like to kiss people. Kissing people is so fun. Or have I picked up on it as a social piece? Or have I seen lots of people kissing in a romantic adult way? So uh, that's how I'm learning, but I haven't fully integrated it, but learning to understand it um, because I'm trying to figure it out and no one is helping me to understand that I should not be kissing everyone. So we look carefully at Sean's behavior to determine our then response, our dim response. And the response can't always be, we're gonna tell Sean's parents and families. One of the things that I like about these millennial parents is they're a little bit different than, you know, folk who were born in the 60s and the 70s parents would function. Um, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it because I'm hearing more and more millennial parents say, well, my kid was here from 8.30 to 5.30. What did you do? I love it when they say that because they're really saying, okay, you're telling me now, but you said it happened at 10.30. I was at work at 10.30. What did you do? And the teachers or the providers or you know, the after school person or the counselors looking at them like, I didn't do anything. I was waiting to tell you. And I think that that's really this, 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 this tension that we've got to reckon with that it's both of our responsibilities. It's this shared responsibility always that the teacher, the provider, the social worker, the counselor should have something that they're moving with. If it's just around language, if it's around, you know, books, if it's around drawing or art, but something that they're doing as an appropriate response. And we're going to get to more of those things around strategies. In addition to this shared that it's not, here's where we have to pivot. Parents cannot hear it as you're telling on my child and you're actually saying it, I'm a bad parent because my child has done that. Because that's often the message that's integrated. So you have, we have to think about when we're sharing it with parents and families, how am I delivering this message? Or what is the message? Because telling my parents, Sean kissed three people today and we kept telling him to stop, does two things. And this is what the, we know for a fact. Stress families 
actually end up with ruptures between them and their children when we tell them things like that. When they don't have the skills to do anything about it, they only get further frustrated with their child. So we come between a family, a parent, and their developing child. The other thing is parents here, you're a bad parent. Your child is doing this because of you. So we need a serious reframe in our response to parents and families. Here's what one example could sound and look like. So Beth, today Sean was really curious and he just was kissing lots of people. You know, We told him you have to ask. We talked about the importance of asking and people may say no. And even if people say yes, one of the things that we usually don't do at, you know, at school is kiss people. We were really clear, really succinct. And then we talked about when can we kiss? And most of that was we may kiss our mom and dad, you know, we may kiss our grandparents if they haven't seen us in a while. So we, we named some people um, to help him resource. So I just really wanted to share with you, Beth, just what happened with us today so that you know what, what our response was and what we did with Sean. And the funny thing, I kept looking and watching and I was near him and afterwards he ended up not kissing anyone else. Which one of those would you want to hear as a parent? Which one of those would you respond to or not respond to? Beth, you unmuted yourself. I wasn't sure if you wanted to speak or if that was by accident. I was just gonna say, thank you for telling me that, Sean. I really appreciate knowing what's happening in the room. So um, anyway, that was what I was gonna respond to. Okay, thank you, thank you. So let's just, so Dr. Brown said the second incident report is much better, <laughs> right, right. Well. Well, it's, it's much better because my impression as a parent is, okay, you did some things. I like what she said that she would do because I may not have any resourcing around my child kissing other than to get in the car and raise my voice and say, don't kiss people, don't kiss anyone. Woo, how did we get there? Now it's don't kiss anyone, but I just kissed grandma and grandpa yesterday. See the confusing message being sent? And that's, Christine's laughing because she's like, that's what people do, right? That's exactly what happens. And then the child's further confused about what was really just something I learned from adults who have kissed me since I was born. Um, my, my, my cousin Leah, who some of you have heard me talk about with her children, she's really um, clear what everybody knows, don't kiss her children. Like her parents hate it, but she got it from her mother, my, my aunt, my father's sister, who she would always say, mom, you kiss everybody. And it bugged Leah. She was like, you kiss everybody when they come over for Thanksgiving, for your birthday. You're supposed to hug people and shake their hands. Everybody kissed you. So Leah's developed this response to, I don't think that's such a good thing, Bob. I'm not telling my children that they have to kiss anybody, including me or their father or you. And my aunt was really upset by it, but she really affirmed like this behavior is not something I'm passing on to my children. Um, and as much as my aunt, and my uncle were upset about it. She's the parent, so we what? They have to live with that. They have to live with it. Um, and I'm all for that parents resourcing what they think is best for them and their children as healthy responses. And the response that you may have today may not be the response and should not be the response you have in three years when your child is three years older because the response needs to be what? Developmentally appropriate. So what we're doing is we're starting a foundation that we always add on, which means we should have a conversation, multiple conversations now, but we don't say, oh, I talked to my kid when they were four about that and my kid's now nine. We should have had multiple conversations about this that are ongoing and continuous. So let's talk about some strategies to resource us in those areas. So the first strategy is sexuality education. You all are doing that now, yes. 46 people on this call, including Beth and Leah. I always say Leah is the smartest person in Alameda County because every PD that they offer, she's pretty much on 98% of them. And she's listening. She's not sitting there with you know rock music playing in the background. She's listening and resourcing as an adult, as a parent, as a partner, as a daughter, as an actualized human being. So I always say her education levels around these PDs are beyond everybody's. Um, I agree, I agree because I talk to her about it and I hear it coming back. Um, but the first place for us is that path of educating ourselves around sexuality education um, for young children, but also for ourselves, because most of us 
did not get it. It's going to look different for everybody. For some of you, the last two days, these you know four hours, it's a starting point, but it can't be the ending place. The next strategy is this notion of positive language. How are we using positive language? Yesterday, I talked about my godson and how he had a nickname for his penis that only his mom and his dad and him knew about. And then I showed up and was like, no, 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 no. We need real language, positive, accurate language for um, him and for us that shared language, what between and among, amongst adults, which is the next strategy, consistency between and across settings that when he's with them and when he's with his grand, his, I was about to say grandfather, his godfather, that we actually have shared language that supports his development, that they're not using a nickname. And then I'm saying penis and he's confused if he's with me or if he's at school and they don't know what that nickname is. So this notion of consistency is really important. Um, and here's the part of consistency. We've got to, for most people, we have to have multiple interactions and conversations so that we get on the same page. It could be the other social worker who's sharing the case. It could be the other teacher. It could be the substitute. It could be the mental health consultant. It could be the other provider who comes and helps. No matter role and responsibility, we've got to have consistency across and between settings. Oh, Dr. Brown says, say more about the last slide. So, so this is actually, um, Diane Levine has written about like sexualized childhoods over a number of years. And this is actually an article. I, I don't typically give it out. I just put that one there because so much of that is, her titles often draw people in around this notion of sexualized childhood. I wanna be clear about my language, Dr. Um, oh, that's not Dr. Brown who said that. Their names look so familiar. One says Nicole with the H and one is Nicole without an H. I'm so sorry. I just realized that I saw that wrong. So this notion of sexualized childhood, I can share the article, but I don't wanna go down that path because it's just like the gender conversation. We end up collapsing things on top of each other. And then folk who are trying to gain knowledge leave more confused, but I will share the article, but it really has a place as a low hanging fruit, I believe around um, when we're not using positive language and children gain the language from their peers and from media and today is much greater than it was 20 years ago and 30 years ago, because I see toddlers who can use a cell phone better than me and get on the iPad. And I think those things are okay, but sometimes they have access to the wrong information um, earlier than necessary, and they don't have the background knowledge or the adults to help them kind of integrate it into um, who they are. So the language associated with that becomes very negative non-affirming and what happens is we end up integrating that into our identity so this notion of using positive language early can prevent that from happening what's that link beth that's a link to the article oh thank you oh you found it on she's so quick yeah i'm gonna take her on the road with me she's so quick about, about everything um so there's consistency between and across adults um, in settings is, is really important. And another strategy is appropriate activities. How many times that have you considered when children play with something like clay that they could actually be what? Engaging in an appropriate early healthy sexual development activity. The children who take that clay and start making what? People, that's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly, we don't see it through that lens but it's the beginning stages of healthy sexual development for young children. Another strategy is accessible children's literature. So this is a brand new book by Tyler Fetter about bodies are cool. Um, I have it in my new stash because it's a, it's a new book. It's a new book. I, I actually have it. And a um, few of you may win a few copies around um, some of our door prizes today. But what's the appropriate literature that we may have in our program, in our lobby, that we give to families, um, that we've talked to the children's librarian about and asked them to get a few copies? Um, I know that when I was directing in San Francisco, we had the, the mobile bookmobile. 
uh, my site was in the lower height. So we could we could literally take a walk if we wanted to in a nice day to the main library and go to the um, the children's section. But the bookmobile came to us and I didn't I never do that. Like the mobile librarian was really paying attention to how careful my staff were with giving them back all the books that we borrowed every time they came. And then what began to happen is they began to let us borrow more and more books. And then what began to happen is it was the end of the year and the librarian said, are there some books you want us to buy? And I was thinking, what? And the librarian said, well, we have some money. So if you tell me what books, we'll buy those books. And I was thinking, oh, it's, that, it's just, that, just that easy? Then he, he ended up saying, oh, these 20 books, you can keep them. They were in mint condition. He said, you can keep, I'm not saying that's gonna happen at every library, but that was my lived experience around accessible children's literature. And then the conversation got, we it took more depth because I was able to say, well, the teachers and the children didn't seem to enjoy these three at all. And then I was able to say, here's why this isn't such a good book because of these pieces in the book. So we were able to have this, what, bi-directional conversation about children's literature that I feel like benefited um, my site, the children and the teachers and the librarian who was able to say, oh, we'll spend more money on these if this is what early learning settings are saying um, they want and they need. So I encourage you all to, um, and I, some of you have been on calls with me before, know I always say um, one of your best friends in early childhood um, is the children's librarian at the library. So another strategy is scripts for teachers and adults. So some of you may be or maybe not familiar with the FLASH curriculum. It's out of King County, which is Seattle in, in Washington state. Um, and they have, last time I looked, it was accessible online uh, for free, but they may have added some other precautions and they always update it. So you always have the most updated information related to um, sexual health and they do it across the span. So they have lessons for, you know, very young children, preschool to third grade, fourth, then they go all the way up, up into the older grades. But this notion of scripts, they really have these lesson skill uh, written out. So this one is around infants and preschoolers, around how to talk to. So here they're talking to high schoolers who are in 11th, 12th grade, but just giving us the language if we don't have the language around how to resource and how to do that. It's a great, great, great strategy. Um, and you know, you all know I only endorse things that I've tried and the FLASH curriculum is, is up there. And you know, I love free things. And because the last time I checked it was free, um, particularly the social workers and folk who work in mental health places, this is a great resource for you because it goes across the age span, but it gives us those scripts as teachers and counselors and consultants, parents and adults, directors, regardless of role or title um, as an adult. It's an effective strategy that goes really back to that first strategy of what sexuality education and where are we getting our education from. So one supports the other. So an additional strategy is dramatic play toys and experiences that starts with what? Putting dolls in the water table and letting children what wash them, but we're not standing by with closed mouths we're adding rich language to it. Oh, you're washing the doll's belly. Oh, you're washing the doll's leg. Oh, you're going to wash the doll's hair now. Ooh, you're washing the doll's chest. Ooh, I see you're washing the doll's, what? The doll's bottom. That's where boo-boo comes from. That's right. It's going to be clean. We all need a clean bottom. That's really the beginning stages for young children. That's oftentimes what? Unnamed, unnamed, and the child knows it's there. They may even try to wash that part of the dial and look at you to say, what are you gonna say now? And then when you say nothing, you sent a concrete message to that four or five year old or even that three year old um, or even that two or one year old. So it starts with the things that we already have in our settings, in our schools, in our homes um, that we can learn to resource them uh, differently. We're gonna, we're gonna to get to some more strategies. So don't, don't, don't worry. Then I just like to juxtapose the differences between being a child and being an adult so that we know that these not only look and sound, but they actually feel different. And we need to observe some clear differences in sexuality between children and adults. 
So for children, it starts with what? Play. It happens in a very playful, um, engaging way that is healthy and familiar to them. It looks like that. But for adults, it's really this act of knowing what's about to happen, what I want to happen. So the difference is if we see young children acting in ways that they have this different level, level of intention with the sexuality, that is a red flag. That is a red flag because that's an, an indication of adult sexuality development. Then for children, this is notion of curiosity, literally curiosity. My little cousin, we were at, she was at her grandmother's house and she had taken a bath and she came down the steps, you know, she thinks she's, uh, I always forget it, the little princess from Frozen, like whatever her name is, my cousin thinks she's that, she has like 20 of those dresses and she wants to put them on every day and she walks around her house saying freeze and you're supposed to stand still. And then if you don't stand still, she gets really upset. But she came down the steps one day, um, literally out of the bathtub with no clothes on. Uh, and, you know, she was giggling and laughing, telling her grandmother that she wanted some chocolate milk. <laughs> um, so in her mind, the chocolate milk was all she could think of. So she got out the tub and made a beeline down the steps. And of course, my aunt was like, you need to go back upstairs and put some clothes on. Why did you come downstairs with no clothes on? And she kind of looked at her like, what are you talking about? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? So I'm watching the whole thing, but it was really this level of curiosity around my body's okay, right? Yeah, I got out of the tub. I'm clean is what I'm integrating. Not that I did something wrong or that me not having on one of my favorite dresses is a problem. So the play and the curiosity often go hand in hand that way. Or the curiosity could be her in the tub with her, what, little brother. And her, her mother told me this one time where she said, I don't want him in the tub anymore. He peed in the tub. He peed in the tub. Um, but this curiosity of, his body does look different than mine um, and her, their parents naming what that is. Adult sexuality, what I know that I want to do, there's some consequential behaviors to it. So you may hear the five-year-old say, if we have sex, you can get pregnant. To a four-year-old in the same environment, that's knowing some, some, some things and then maybe what? Trying to act that out. That's a real adult level of sexuality development that not just is about babies and birthing, that's normal, but them saying, if we do this act, here's what happens with that act. That's a different level of knowledge when they try to act it out. That's really, really different. Um, and people think, oh, if you tell children this information, they're gonna wanna act it out. Not true. So I taught at Nia House Montessori in Berkeley and we used to teach the cycle of life every year to um, every group of students. So one y'all never forget it. And we teach the cycle of life that each egg needs a sperm. Um, and we talk about animals and we talk about people. And we know that children need to hear it multiple times. They needed to be repeated. And Olivia was literally trying to integrate the knowledge at home. Her mother happened to be cooking the eggs one morning. This is a true story. And Olivia stood by the stove preschool. And she said, mama, those eggs need a sperm. And her mother was like, what just happened? <laughs> like, and then she came to school and said, guess what she just told me today? But she knew where she got it from because we didn't just talk about this is what we're learning when we talk about health and sexuality development, but each week they knew what was happening. So she knew immediately where she got it from. Um, and she came to us because she said, if it happens again, what should I say? She said, I just nodded my head. But she said, I didn't know what else to say. That's that relationship that we want, that she was well-informed. So when her daughter was putting the cycle of life, meaning you're scrambling eggs and those eggs need a sperm, she was integrating, as preschoolers do, some of what she learned in a different way, but totally developmentally appropriate. For children, um, childhood sexuality is often spontaneous. It's not planned. You know, they didn't think about it last night and say tomorrow during nap time, I'm gonna do this thing. It is spontaneous. It happens in the moment. I'm in the bathroom. The other child is in the bathroom. We're both three or we're both four. We're both six and we're both urinating. And then we start to giggle. And then we both say, oh, I see your, you know, your penis or if they have a nickname for it. It's usually spontaneous that way. Um, and then it goes away. 
Where adult sexuality says, I may be self-conscious of this act and what we want to do, um, where children typically have this level of openness about it. Like I just described my cousin, her openness was, I'm clean. We got in the bathtub to get clean, but I want some chocolate milk now, <laughs> grandma. So while my mother was drying off my brother, I ran down the steps and said, I want some chocolate milk. Um, whereas adult sexuality typically has strict levels of privacy around when and where these things happen. This is not the same privacy as children who are developing from preschool to school age and may say, you know, I don't want to get in the bathtub with my younger siblings anymore. I want the door closed when I use the bathroom. Um, I know growing up in my house, if you were a child, closing the bathroom door is what you could not do. If you, when you, when you pottied and you no longer had to put on a, a diaper, I just saw Lorna nod her head. When you went into the bathroom as a four-year-old, I couldn't close the door behind me and lock it and then no adult could get in there. Uh, that was just what happened in my house. Now, was it right or wrong? I don't even think that's the, that's the question, but this notion of privacy would begin to change as you got older. Then the expectation changes that, oh, as a 10 year old, you should close the door when you use the bathroom. Um, but for adults, this level of privacy looks different than the developmental continuum that my four year old cousin is really open. Her older cousin who's nine, she closes the bathroom door when she goes into the bathroom and she would not run down the steps into the kitchen after taking the bath or shower saying that she wanted some chocolate milk. And then this notion of uh, sensuality, and that usually happens with young children around kissing or you know rubbing their head or back rubs, these things that feel good, but that are not passion the way adults demonstrate um, adult level sexuality. And we often lump them together and misread it. And this notion of excitement and eroticism that children get excited, they giggle, you're just trying to figure it out. It's not making a lot of sense. They're trying to make sense out of it. It may even feel good. That is not the same as eroticism. And what you notice if you're paying attention, everything on the left side of this chart is really playful and fun. Well, everything on the right side is about having not just base knowledge, but some intention about outcome. Where the things on the left side, the intention of outcome, there isn't one. Those are some fundamental differences when we juxtapose the two together. And then some notes on reporting, because I know that many people on this call either run early childhood programs, they work in them, or you're just a mandated reporter in general. So we have a role in prevention and reporting. Um, and that role is to act, to act early, and actually to act. Now, here's the part that as a consultant where, um, I've actually had, I thought I was gonna lose the contract, but they didn't take it from me. Um, that some programs tell people, if you suspect something, if you think something happened, tell us. But the mandate is, I don't have to know, meaning that is true, which is why I say we don't diagnose. I can suspect this is happening. It's someone else's job to investigate. So that action is there. I wanna be really clear with my language because my inaction in doing any of that could lead to ongoing and detrimental harm, neglect and abuse for young children. And it turns out that those things are oftentimes physical, sexual and emotional. So we all have a charge as counselors, as therapists, as mental health consultants, as teachers, as social workers, as counselors, as playgroup facilitators, whatever your role is, as the bus driver, as the cook, as the parent, as the coordinator, Whatever your role and responsibility and title is, if you work with children and families, we all have a responsibility to do no harm. And in doing no harm, that means we're not, we, this notion of I'm gonna hold it and do nothing with it and see what happens. When if you've seen something that is a red flag, you can immediately make a call. I wanna be clear on that. But if, you're, if your program says, you know, we've seen this before, let's watch and let's take good notes and then let's be in conversation with the parents and the families. All of that is action. All of that is action. So this note on reporting is, I see something, I do nothing with it. I don't tell anyone. I don't call Lorna, my supervisor, and tell her. I don't call Rochelle, my director, and tell her. I don't tell the mental health consultant. I just act like it didn't happen. That is very harmful because our mandate demands that we do something different. Rochelle just got her camera on. I demand that we do something. Our, our, the mandate demands that we do something different, not to hold it and do nothing with it. So I want to be really clear there 
around um, what we create oftentimes as an air, a shade of gray. And I like to say that shade of gray is almost non-existent for the most part, that I'm either acting or I'm not acting. And I can act by all of those ways of identifying, assessing, and then doing something in response to developmentally appropriate concerns or red flags, but not doing anything across that continuum is um, a problem. Beth Hoke said protective services or the police, right? Side That's note, true. for further education opportunities later, when you say it's somebody else's job to investigate, sorry for the ignorance, but what is that? Oh, so basically, if I work at, let's say I work at ABC Child Development Center, and I say, ooh, Beth and Sean were kissing, and I, I caught them, and they looked like they were about to pull their pants down, that I may say, this was awful, this should not have happened then my director may say, okay, we're just going to talk to their parents. And then I feel like, oh, someone else has to know. I do have a mandate where I can report that to licensing. Licensing will come out, investigate. They may talk to the family and they may say, oh, this is just normal behavior. You all need a supervision plan. Or they may talk to the family and say, there's something going on in this other child's house that you all aren't aware of. We're going to actually do some further investigation um, and that could be the parent and families may need to go to parent education. It may mean they may open up a case and say, your children are removed from you. Um, it could be a combination of them being removed. If you complete these things, you'll have a social worker or counselor for a number of months, and then your children can be placed back with you. That what I, what I say, it's not our job to investigate, is it's their role and responsibility to do that once we report it. Um, and, and sometimes people get confused around that part around what is reportable and what's not reportable. Here's what a, a licensing agent told me years ago that stayed with me. She basically said, Sean, I was a director in San Francisco. She says, everything's reportable. We determine if, we, if something needs to be done with it or not. So I was like, oh, because I'm thinking I'm trained on don't report certain things. And she was basically saying, if you report it and nothing's going to be done, we're going to say, oh, there's no problem. So she was really telling me, don't vacillate between, is this reportable or is this not reportable? That if it is of concern or if it is a red flag, I should report it. They'll do the investigation to determine the outcome. And what many programs do is they do that themselves. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I often find when we do that, I've witnessed on the periphery, children and families being harmed because it took too long to get them help. Which is hey, Sean. Go ahead. I have a question. So I'm trying to understand a little bit here. So for me, as a licensed clinical social worker, um, I'm mandated to report to Child Protective Services or the police if it's you know something really imminent and we can't mm -hmm. you know the really imminent danger to the kid. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is that family child care or child care providers, um, professionals report to licensing or is it both and CPS and licensing? They talk to they talk to each other. So if if I call licensing as a director or manager of a licensed child care in Alameda County, they automatically talk to the people that as a as a licensed therapist you talk to. I could pick up the phone and call 911 in an immediate emergency if I felt like, oh this needs the police to come immediately. When they hear child care, they make the call and then the other representatives show up. They talk to each other, Beth. Oh. So you don't have to make a CPS report because for, for me, and I thought this was true for Chuka, that whoever has it has to make a CPS report, but I guess not. Whoever has. Whoever has, has the information, witness to hearing something, seeing something from a child, that person has to make the report that nobody can't right. have. Right, You're, yeah. I'm, making, I'm making a report, but I can make the report to my licensing body. And then they, they- um, Decide. No, they don't decide. They will investigate. And then if it escalates and Child Protective Services gets involved, they're all okay. involved. So here, here's literally what happened. I was in Alameda, November of 2019. Mm -hmm. During nap time, a little boy climbed on top of another little girl. Mm -hmm. When the teacher that was in the room who was on her cell phone, um, the other teacher came back from her break and cut the lights on and saw him on top of her, the other little girl's pants were down. He's oh, a preschooler. Mm -hmm. So a report was immediately made. To? The, 
the, re the report was made to licensing, CPS and the police showed up. Uh huh. The licensing agent didn't show up for three weeks. Huh. But we called licensing. The person on the phone sent the dispatch. I was still there as the consultant. The police and CPS showed up. They were there for three hours. They had to wait for the mother to come, the father to come. They interviewed the older siblings who were in elementary school. Yeah. All of that happened. But I think for people who don't know Beth, if they're unsure, we can always over-report, meaning contact license and CPS <laughs> and just wait across every T and dot every I. I mean, making, you can never go, it's never bad to make a report to Child Protective Services right? because it's a suspicion and you just don't know. And nobody can tell you to not make a report. The director can't say, no, nah, don't make a report. It's an, mm -mm. You can make a report because it's in your own life and um, career. You want to. And that's what I was really trying to get everybody to get to, Beth. That yeah. Oh, sorry. I know that sometimes people are told, tell us, don't tell uh -huh. them. And right. That the mandate says, I don't have to tell anybody. I can just make the report and, and, the, and that I should be doing that. And this is in the reporting training. I just wanted people to be clear around issues of sexual development in young children when we're talking about developmentally appropriate ones versus red flags we may actually have a plan in place for the red flag in addition to their red fl that that plan in place we also need to do this other thing for yeah. red flag situations which is the point i was trying to drive home not okay. to take this into a, a license sorry because if I, I i just want to end with this before we move to the next one if at any point you're confused the licensing trainings in California are now online, um, or you could reach out and say, you know, when is the next one I need to be, you know, retrained or have a curious conversation with the licensing agent that, uh, you know, answers the phone around what you should do in, in, in those specific places that are servicing young children as child care centers. That's specifically um, what I was, what I was really trying to drive home to people. Um, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. So in terms of these other red flags that we pay attention to before we move to what to teach, um, we mentioned this yesterday, why differences in ages of children? Um, why differences? And that, that link, I see Dana put a link in there, but their abuse and neglect document actually talks about um, ages in children. They usually talk about older children. So a 16 year old and 18 year old or a 17 year old or 19 year old and that three year age difference. But we need to understand that around a three-year-old and a five-year-old or a four-year-old and a seven-year-old um, wide age differences, older children typically have more what information about themselves and other people. Um, and if you have that four-year-old who's always with that eight-year-old, then we need to be paying attention closely to what they're learning and what those experiences are if we're around the issue of healthy sexual development and unhealthy sexual development around them pot pot potentially being taken advantage of. Um, we need to take notice to issues of when children are forcing children, saying, come play with me, come behind the play structure, um, they may threaten or intimidate them. Those are all red flags to pay attention to. Um, this notion of escalating, yesterday we talked about it as pervasive patterns of sexual behavior in young children. If it continues to escalate, that's a red flag that you've responded to it. Our response was developmentally appropriate. The parents are on board and it continues to escalate. Those are red flags, okay? Um, and another red flag for us to pay attention to in those early childhood years, um, are when children are being lied to by their peers or older students, when they're being fooled or tricked. And what we know is that this, these three oftentimes happen to children with disabilities, that they get lied to, they get tricked or fooled um, because the other children have picked up on that, that learning trajectory is a little bit different. So we really need to pay attention to these as red flag behaviors, all right? So we're gonna jump right into this notion of what to teach, what to teach in um, about four slides. And then we're gonna look at some, some scenarios after that, Leah, come back and watch a short video and then some messages from that video talk about um, some our, our rich handouts and we'll wrap up our time to, um, together. All right. So the, ne the next session in the next few slides, 
some, some clear indications of what we should teach, what we should teach. The differences between safe and unsafe and not this notion of teaching good and bad. Remember yesterday, we, we alluded to this, this notion of when we talk about good and bad, that is confusing to young children because they're being touched inappropriately, but it could feel good to some of them. And to some others, it doesn't feel good, but the child who it feels good to becomes really confusing because it's actually an unsafe touch. So this notion of safe and unsafe and teaching boundaries and areas of our body where um, it's okay for people to touch and areas of our body where it's not okay for people to touch. So it become what we talked about yesterday, really concrete with young children. Um, I often say one of the great things that adults can do, because it's familiar to most people, is head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Reteach yourself that song and then think about all the parts of the body that are left out and how do we add those parts of the body to that song. Um, something that's familiar to children and you can say, we're gonna add on to it. You can do that with preschoolers who all learn head, shoulders, knees, and toes as two-year-olds. Now that I'm four, you can say, what are some other parts of our body? If we think of our head all the way down to our toes. So the song says head, shoulders, knees, and toes, eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Can we name some other parts of the body? I might use a, a, a doll or I might use a person or a cutout or a picture in a book. And then as they call out those parts of the body, I could do this with just my child at home on the sofa um, or sitting in the park, you know, at the kitchen table or in a small group in my Head Start classroom. And they start calling those out and I'm labeling them that we keep building on this activity. So the goal isn't to do it all that day, but to keep building on it and coming back with the goal of getting to this notion of safe and unsafe because we've identified parts of our bodies from my head to toe. And then what I insert is what all the parts that they've probably left out. The next thing we need to discuss what to teach is distinguishing, because it is confusing between private touches and confusing touches, private touches and confusing touches, which is the buildup of starting here. So we don't start with confusing in private. We start with something that's very familiar and then the scaffold takes us here. So this is an ongoing and continuous curriculum lesson that we should be building upon throughout the school year, just like language and literacy and just like math. It's not isolated, it doesn't happen on these two days and we never come back to it, but we're building on it. And that these push points are things for us to consider, for us to really consider. The other piece is this notion of what are the limits in our home around sexual behavior? What are the limits in our program, in our classroom, in our school, our socialization group around sexual behavior? What are, how do we respond to kissing here? How do we respond to hand holding and hugging? How do we respond to children who are saying, you know, you're my boyfriend or you're my girlfriend? Um, how might we respond to a little girl saying to another little girl, you're my girlfriend or another little boy saying you're my boyfriend to another little boy? What's our, we need to think about these things beforehand so that we're teaching to them and not so much ignoring them and children pick up on, we said this at Circle and no one said anything. And I just like to say, so around setting these limits, a lot of the handouts that I'm gonna provide allow you some um, to drill down deeper in these areas for your, um, your growth and your learning and, and development. And I'm thinking of Dana and specifically because she says she teaches adult learners and these are the two topics that the textbooks probably offer a paragraph to and don't allow any depth. And those are the pieces where you can say, we wanna read this and then we're gonna talk about it in the next class as a way to go deeper. And what I find, you know, as someone who's taught adults is when we do that, they wanna do it, they wanna have the conversations and they wanna know what is my role and responsibility in this. Um, so I, I, I agree with you from yesterday, Dana, it's a missing piece that I think adult learners are, um, are wanting to integrate into practice. They just don't know how. So this other thing that we need to teach and anticipate is um, how do we ask children questions in non-threatening ways? You know, what books are we gonna use? What television programs are we gonna to watch together? 
um, and then ask curious questions. I know my mother was great at this. We would watch things together. Um, and she would say, why do you think he did that? Would you do that too? And I realized later, those were all her tests on my response. She was gaining crucial knowledge as a, you know, as a preteen around what my thinking was, but it was non-threatening. We were seated, seated on the sofa as a family, watching the show. And if someone did something that, you know, was either threatening or kind of off, she would kind of just say, what do you think about that? And it wasn't so much, here's what he should have done. Don't you ever do that? It was always, what do you think about that? Why do you think they did that? What do you call that? Have you heard anyone call it something different? Why do you think they're gonna do that? Why do you, what, what do you think is happening? That we can ask those questions because that's the teaching to gain knowledge from our children or others' children that we're caring for into what our response can be as a next step, all right? So you're all gonna go into breakout rooms, short scenarios, and the goal is for you to use some of the information you've gathered yesterday and today um, to create with the three of you, a group response when we give these scenarios some thought around ways you, you might respond uh, on this learning journey. And then we're gonna come back and, and, and hear from some of you and then move to the, the, the next part of the training. Okay, so I'm here. So our first scenario is Little Missy. So Dana, Nicole, and Savita, this is your scenario. You're gonna discuss Missy. Dana, Nicole, and Savita, you're going into room one. This is your scenario. So take a screenshot or take a picture with your phone. You're gonna be the first group with this first scenario around Missy um, and rest time. Awesome. Second scenario, we have little Kevin who's always announcing during snack time. So in room two, we have Juana, Rosa, and Savannah. Juana, Juana, Rosa, and Savannah. This is your scenario about Kevin. Take a screenshot or a photo with your camera. The next scenario is John and Mike in the bathroom. And in this room, we have room three, Renuku, Renuka, PJ, and Aninye. You're in room three. This is your scenario. Awesome. Room four has Cassie. I think that's Cassie, not Casey. Um, if it's not, I'm sorry, Maria and Rochelle. You have Jasper and Luke. Jasper and Luke is your scenario. Awesome, I just saw Rochelle take a picture. In room five, we have Nadine, Theodorita, and Beth. Um, the three-year-old classroom keeps asking, where do babies come from? That's your scenario. April during nap time, we have Crystal Lewis, Leanne, and Treza. This is your scenario. April takes off her clothes during nap time. Our next scenario is about H Hector um, and what he tells folk. We have Angela, Jess Williams, and Reshma. Take a picture or a screenshot. Yeah. Our next scenario is Jan. So we have Lorna Knight, Bayon, and Vanessa Lopez. You're in room eight. This is your scenario. Our next scenario is about Heather and outside on the climbing structure. And we have Christine and Sybil. Christine and Sybil. That's gonna be a great group, I'm sure. Our next group is Kathy Garcia, Moses Mo Santos, and Tracy Weber. Your scenario is about Gina during story time. Our next scenario is Nixon. He wants to kiss everybody. We have Marjorie and Yaneth. Marjorie and Yaneth. Nixon during story time. Our next scenario is Muhammad. Muhammad. And we have in room 12, Carlotta, Claudia, and Sarah. Carlotta, Claudia, and Sarah. Sarah Ross, Claudia Benitez, and Carlotta Hernandez de Cruz. You have Muhammad. And in room 13, we're gonna go back um, 
to our first scenario. And we have Dr. Nicole Brown, Miriam Jimenez, and Raquel Javez. You have Missy's scenario also. All right, so I'm going to put you there now. You're able to um, talk, assess the situation, identify, assess, and communicate some strategies and what your next steps would be, any of these people on the screen that you might use. Um, and then we're going to come back and hear from some of you. All right, so I'm opening the rooms now. Great. So thank you all who went into the breakout rooms and I tried to filter through them all to make sure no one was sitting there by themselves. So I appreciate it, seeing people on screen and hearing just 10 seconds of the conversation. So that's for me, always encouraging that uh, folk were in there uh, doing the work of just talking and practicing and resourcing with each other. So let's move forward. We won't get through every scenario, um, but what I would prefer to do is if someone wants to speak for their group and their scenario, we'll, we'll do it that way before we move forward. We may just hear um, two, maybe three scenarios. We won't go through them all. So does anyone want to share what you and your group discussed in your scenario? I can do it. Parlata, go ahead. Thank you. OK. Um, I was talking to Claudia and Sarah. I was listening to them first. And then um, I asked them, uh, you know, I've been working in the early childhood for more than 10 years, uh, especially with preschoolers. And um, I see that there is a lot of missing information for this um, child. And uh, I know that's his first time, the teacher observing that he's following his peers to the bathroom. But do we know if he is potty trained? Do we know um, how he's at home? At home, we have only one bathroom. We're going by ourselves. Is that curiosity? Uh, and I think before doing any steps, uh, I think as a, a teachers, they just need to observe and continue observing this behavior before before we taking any steps. Okay, thank you, Carlotta. So you all had Mohammed followed the peer into the bathroom. I heard yes. some great things, Carlotta. So I intentionally left age off most of them on purpose <laughs> um, so that we would do exactly what you just start talk, doing, Carlotta, so that as you were identifying, you were asking yourself as the adult curious questions and, and, and literally saying, you know, is this a two-year-old? Is this a four-year-old? You know, it only happened one time that we're, we're, we're responding to it in this curious nature, um, but continuing to pay attention. Um, is a big piece of following those steps to determine. So if you, if your group, I'm not sure if your group did this, Carlotta, um, green behaviors that are developmentally appropriate, yellow behaviors that are a concern, or red behaviors that are a red flag, which, which pot did your group, or which group, which group did your trio put this scenario in, or did you not talk about that? Uh, I don't think we did, but, uh, but I think for me it's, it's, I can say it can be just, I know you say it's not normal, it's curiosity. It is, it is kind of like, I don't, I don't see nothing wrong with it. Right, so you said it happened one time. It was the first time you all <laughs> observed it. So we're gonna say, you know what? Maybe it was curiosity, it was developmentally appropriate. We'll watch. And was this a two-year-old who's learning how to potty? Is this a four-year-old who's already pottied? But this notion of, okay, we're gonna watch. It seemed to be spontaneous. It hasn't happened before. I, I, I stand with you in solidarity in that response, Carlotta. Thank you. Okay. Maybe, oh, Savannah raised her hand. Go, is that Savannah? Savannah. Savannah, I'm sorry, Savannah. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so our group had um, Kevin um, announcing at snack time that girls, stand, uh, girls sit down when they pee, boys stand up. Um, and we felt like that was green, which is developmentally appropriate. Um, we did feel like that um, we would acknowledge him, um, say that he is correct, that's true, um, keep a positive note on it so that we can encourage his self-exploratory or um, self-discovery. Mm -hmm. um, that we would also maybe just um, put a pin in it and say that we can have this as a later discussion um, after snack time, because right now we're gonna have snack time. 
um, but also um, knowing that it's probably gonna open up more questions and conversation from other children. And so allowing that to be a possibility. And then um, as far as who we were gonna tell, we said that we don't think that we need to report it to anybody. I said that maybe we could tell the parent just so that they can learn from our positive reaction, just in case it happens with them at home or anywhere else. Definitely, I, I, I like that affirmation of, yep, boys stand up to pee, girls sit down. And then I would, I, would, I would challenge us, I shouldn't use the word challenge, I would encourage us to then move towards, you know, some boys do stand up to pee, some boys sit down to pee. Because um, there's this false notion that if you are male born, you only stand up to pee. And one of the things that as a male that I train parents around all the time, and it's easy to get the moms to it. And then the mom's like this, I'm doing this today. And the dads are like, wait a minute. And then as a male, I have to say to the dads, his penis will not fall off if he sits down and takes in peace. It's, it's not gonna disappear. And it's really around when I'm working with parents and families, the little boys peeing on the floor and them saying, I'm constantly cleaning the bathroom floor. I have a three-year-old, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And then we have the conversation around, well, you know, male-born children can sit down and pee too. So moving up that anti-bias continuum around, some boys do stand up and pee. Yep, but some boys sit down and pee. Um, as, as this notion of how do we move towards this healthy space on the continuum. Rochelle, you look like you had something to say. I just really like this question. When I saw the scenario, I was like, ooh, but also in other cultures, um, they start toilet training so much earlier that everybody stands up to pee. Some people stand over a pot, you know what I mean? So that conversation could go so many different directions and get so deep when you're learning about different cultures too. Um, I just, I've always liked that question, but she did a good job. No, I think it was effective. And, I, and really us under, this was the point of us talking um, and this resourcing of most of us learn one way as we continue to learn as a species, we expand our understanding and our learning on that continuum. Like I didn't even bring the cultural piece into it around depending on where you were born, um, or how your parents were born and what they were, were learned and were trained that would impact all of you know me using the bathroom, how I use the bathroom and how that impacts my identity and my healthy or potentially unhealthy sexual development. So us being curious learners is a big part. Thank you, Sabine, that was... Thank you, uh, Rochelle. Do we have another volunteer who wants to share out their scenario? And then I could, go ahead. I could, our scenario was about John and Mike in the bathroom with, with their penises out and their mm -hmm. hands were on one another's penis. How do you respond? Well, we talked about it could be curiosity. Maybe we just had, they might just had, have a, had a lesson about parts of the body. So they were being curious when we were both in the bathroom and touching one another's penis. So we have to look at the expression on their face. What are they saying? What conversation are they having around what they were doing? That would also help us to know what next to do. And it could be a teachable moment to let them know that it's unsafe to touch one another's penis, to keep their hands to themselves. And then we and what we could do to learn more probably go to the book section. They would probably have books about parts of the body and explain more if we've not had a, a lesson. And if we had a lesson already, to also bring them back to the lesson to remind them that it was unsafe and um, to, to, to touch each other's body, especially in that, um, in that area. And then whether to report to families, we also talked about reporting it to the, well, I not the word report to the family, but to explain to the, to the parent as in what happened in the classroom and what we did about it together. Just like the example you gave earlier, because the way you say it to the parent will determine the parent's reaction or response to the child and to the, to the situation of what happened. So it's not really, when you're reporting like, oh, this happened and the parents might react in a negative way and they might already be stressed about other things and we don't want to add to their life stresses, but just to give them proper understanding and also a teachable moment for the parents as well on what we have done. And also to we, we tell the co-teacher because what we observed was just the one time we're seeing it for the first time. It's possible that that had happened before or that has been happening. 
And if that's the case, then we need to report to license, you know, we need to report to, to the director and report to, to licensing because we are mandated reporters. But if it was just a one time and the child is being curious, then we might not report to, to licensing. I don't know if my group members wanted to add any other thing to that that we talked about. Who else was in your group? Um, it was PJ and Renuka. The only other thing that we talked about was just the idea of like supervision too, that like that would be a great idea in terms of communicating to the co-teacher or any other staff, like if it's a childcare setting um, or the director to ensure that, okay, we noticed these two boys might have curiosity or maybe this is a way they were trying out to play with each other. And so really being intentional about how are we going to keep monitoring this after these initial conversations. I Thank you so much for that, PJ. That's in... I heard Anita said, you know, the report, a report to licensing, that's going to be the first thing they come up with for you around what is your supervision plan? Like that is, that's going to be their drill down. Do you have one in place? Show it to us. How are you following through? Um, but I want to go. So thank you for that, PJ, because we all need to understand that if we're in uh, centers and family child care homes, but this other space of the teacher observing, and we're only talking about what we saw, not potentially what we didn't see. This may or may not happen again, but for the group on the call, is this a green behavior, a yellow concern behavior, or a red flag, red behavior? Where would you all, where would you all situate John and Mike um, in the bathroom? In I would call it a red flag. What, what under, why are you identifying it as a red flag? Because it's an, on, on, even though they might be curious, but mm -hmm. it's unsafe. So what part is unsafe? Where they're touching their penis is, is unsafe. They should actually keep their hands to their bodies and not touching each other's body. Okay, all right. So Lorna, you said green. So Lorna's at the other end of the continuum. Lorna said, <laughs> this, is, this is a developmentally appropriate behavior for four-year-olds. Talk yeah. to us about that, Lorna. Um, I think that I've, I've seen preschoolers, you know, they touch each other's hair, they touch each other's shirt, they touch, you know, they're curious, you know, is this like mine? Is this, and so it's not like it, they have any context of a penis being anything but a body part. So if you had a sticker on your arm, they want to see it, they just grab it and take a look. So, um, so it's not something you know, we have a context about the penis being something else other than a part of the body. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that, Lorna. And I appreciate all the responses because this is the learning lift. Remember yesterday, we all, when we were assessing ourselves, we were across that continuum. So we're all understanding that, that this is a learning lift and we're figuring out if these things happen, where, as I, as I observe this, is this developmentally appropriate? We know that play and curiosity is appropriate. They're in the bathroom. You know, when we're in the bathroom, we oftentimes either pull our pants down to take a poo or we stand up if we're male sometimes to, to actually uh, urinate. That part's all natural in terms of the context. Remember, we have to consider the context. So the, the context says this may or may not be curiosity or appropriate, which is why we have to do what? Make sure that we're there. So back to what PJ says, I need to make sure that every time someone's in the bathroom, I'm there because that will actually prevent this from happening again. Because if it happens again, if there's this intention to try to sneak and make it happen again, then as the adult, I'm able to say, uh-oh, this is an area of concern. Or even, you know, as Nicole just put around children who may be abused, who may have that different level of, of intention. And what we know is when that happens, the level of intention increases it'll probably escalate opposed to, uh-oh, John and Mike, this happened one time, they were curious. We never saw it happen again. As Lorna said, that was a green behavior. Uh-oh, I see this happening more and more and more. This is an area of concern. Nope, we know some things about John's life and we know some things about Mike's life. This happened, let's create another type of plan. So we're using all of that information to, to resource ourselves um, based on these open scenarios. So they were designed their way intentionally to get us to, um, to talk ab ab about this notion of 
things that children actually um, do or don't do in the, on the continuum of healthy sexual development in young children. Beth, you look like you want to say something. No, okay. <laughs> so if no, if we... I think it's all, I think people are. This is great. I loved hearing the thing Sean you said about opening some some male born people like to pee standing up, and some male born people like to pee sitting down. I can't remember how you phrased it, but the I would like want to burn it into my head. So thank you for that. Right, right, right. Or as Rochelle said, depending on what country you are, regardless of your gender, you pee yes. standing up. You yes, I love all that. It's so many, helpful. For many of us here, that's this learning lift, particularly somewhere like the Bay Area, where we have such a huge population who end up there across the globe. So how do we resource to find out more about children and families in a way that's welcoming and reflective of who they are instead of unhealthy and restrictive and saying fit into this box of that? And that's their ongoing work. That's their ongoing work. Yeah, such good conversations. I appreciate everybody's input. Um, so I'm going to move to the next part just because I would love for us to go over every scenario, but I'm paying attention to the time. Um, Beth has helped me develop that capacity over the years because I suck at paying attention to time when I'm facilitating. So we're going to watch a short video um, that I actually first saw years ago from my good friends at Bananas in Oakland. They actually had the video. Um, it's still there. Um, in their resource uh, catalog, even though that's kind of shifted, you know, this was when everything was VHS. Um, but I ended up getting the video um, based on me seeing it in that library and incorporated it into um, the training. So it's a short video, Bodies, Birth, and Babies. Um, we're going to watch it. And while you watch, think of, and I'm using this word intentionally, regardless of setting, meaning home, school, play group, socialization, play therapy. Wherever, wherever I am. Um, what curriculum tools do you notice that this adult uses to support healthy sexual development? So what curriculum tools do you notice that the adult uses to support healthy sexual development? I want you to think about that while we watch the video. So I'm pressing play now. So if your sound isn't up, this may be a good time to uh, cut it up because this is an older video as you can see. Big if the babies came out this big, right? And maybe this and my is mom still got a car. In the back, in, in, in my back, in my back, you take the baby, and the baby you have a girl go back to the off. So, so the doctor took the baby out and then cleaned the baby off. Mm -hmm. Were you there when the baby was born? I was in home. You were home. The baby was coming out in the mouth. The baby came out of the mouth. Can that happen? Can that happen? No, babies don't come out of my mouth. Where do they come out? Here. Down here, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Well, the whole idea of the video is to um, to show that kids can learn this stuff um, very easily and that they have a lot of interest in it. Um, and to also show that they can be very easy to teach as well. It's not something, it's something that, that adults can perhaps be very emotional about, but things that children find just naturally curious about. See, here's a picture of the mommy without any clothes on. Here's her stomach. Her stomach is way up here, so when she eats it goes here, but the baby grows way down here, way down here, in the part called the uterus. And that's the part that gets bigger and when, bigger when, as the baby gets grows. When, when, when the doctor See cut that? it, and then the baby come out. Now you have it. So it didn't come out of her mouth. 
Yeah, there's a tiny baby inside her uterus, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it down and goes. Yeah. I feel very comfortable teaching this. I, I think it, it takes some work. I think initially most teachers, including myself when I started, are uncomfortable. And it takes a little while to get used to doing that. But once you do, you realize that it's... Um, it goes with how we want to teach children. We want to answer their questions. If they ask you questions related to sexuality, that you would just answer them like you would answer any other question. Well, let's read a story. This is a really fun story called Belly Buttons on Navels. What is this a picture of? It's a bathtub. A bathtub. There's a, a brother and a sister and a kitty cat. Yes. What do you think this is, asked Mary. What is she pointing at? What's Mary pointing at there? Her nose. Robert says, that's your nose. Is that her nose she's pointing to? Yeah, so it looks, look, looks like the kitty cat's almost looking at the nose, too. Where's your nose? Very good. And now he's holding up, Mary's holding up her fingers and, say, and saying, I have fingers. I, wiggle your fingers for me. Everyone, wiggle your fingers. Wiggle your fingers. Now they're pointing at their chest. What do you think they're pointing at here? The chest. The chest? They're pointing at the two dark things on there called their nipples. They say, I have two nipples. All boys and girls have nipples. That's right. The two dark spots on their chest. So now they're standing up. Yeah, what does the girl have? You've mentioned that the boy has a penis, but what does the girl have? Did you see the picture of her? What's that called? That's right. That's actually called her vagina, her vulva, sometimes people call it. So girls have vulvas and boys have penises. Right. Right. So that's right. So all along they've had all the same things. They both have ears and nose and nipples, but now they have something different. Can you see that? The boy has the penis and the girl has the vulva. And she's pointing to her vulva there. And then they move on to their legs. They both have legs, don't they? And there are their legs. Where are your legs? Right here. Can you do this? Can you're marching on the ground? How can they feel good about their bodies if they don't know all the names to all their body parts? It makes sense that if they know their eyes and their, their nose and their ears, that they should know all the parts of their body. Um, including the sexual parts, of course. I have a girl and a boy doll. Want to check them out? Does she have a baby? Well, she doesn't have a baby because she's only a little girl. <laughs> she can't have babies yet until she's, mom, until she's older. <laughs> What's that? It's a little different, huh? He's he just a boy. Yeah, he's a boy, yeah. Do you know what that part's called that you're touching right there? This is the penis, and this part back here is called the scrotum. Yeah, are any of these babies boys? No. That one's a boy? She doesn't have one. What does she have? She has a vulva and a vagina. That's because she's a girl. Yeah. She has the hair on the inside. But that's, that's what oh, girls are like. Yeah. Particularly little girls often do not uh, know that, that they have a vulva or a vagina. They know that they don't have a penis. Most boys don't understand they have a penis, but girls don't always know. And we saw that today, that um, a lot of children didn't know what to call that part of the girl's body. And if they don't know the name of their own body part, well, perhaps they don't feel that that is part of them, that they have the right to say no to someone touching that. They don't own that part of their body. So we want children to feel good about their bodies. How do you think your baby feels now that it's warm, or now that it's clean? Think it feels good? Very nice. Very nice. You've done such a nice job. 
watching the boys uh, playing with the dolls. And they were very good, come to think of it, very good with, with holding the dolls very lovingly. None of this rough throwing that they might have been doing among themselves earlier. But when they were playing with the dolls, very nurturing touch, the caring touch, um, very gentle. Clearly they had had some modeling of, of how to take care of a baby, and that was so nice to see. Very nice touch with Stephanie. You're right, There's, she still has a soft spot up here that you have to be very careful with. So you don't want to drop babies because that can hurt them. We have skulls that cover our whole head, but she doesn't have that totally yet. It's still soft up there. She doesn't have any hair yet either, does she? She has blue yeah. eyes. She does oh, like that. You have blue eyes. Oh, yeah, do you know why? Look at I've you. got blue eyes too. So I have a baby with blue eyes. <laughs> And I bet your mommy probably has brown eyes. Pretty brown eyes, just like yours, yeah. Well, Meredith's dad has blue eyes, too. Come on over. Yeah. Baby. So we were just talking about whether this is a boy baby or a girl baby. What do you think? Baby. They're saying boy baby. What do you think? Boy baby. Michael? Yeah. Do you think this is a boy or a girl? Do you think a boy to Jake? What do you think? You think a boy too? Yeah. Now how do you know for sure? Yeah. Now how old do you think this baby is? Uh, Any idea? One year old. One years old. Okay. Uh, so she's less than that? Younger than that? She was born right around Halloween. Do you remember when Halloween was? Uh-huh. Back in October. So she's five months old. We were uh, involving both boys and girls in taking care of the baby dolls. And washing the babies and reading the books with me. They had equal opportunities. Both boys and girls could join in there. That we weren't limiting one child, one sex from doing one thing and one from doing another. That children have equal opportunities and therefore they're, they feel powerful because they're able to do anything. Where's your body? Point, everybody right point here. to your body for me. Okay. How about from the top of your head? Where does your body go? Okay. It's my body. That's what this book is called. And how's this little boy look now? Better. Yeah, he looks better, doesn't he? He looks kind of happy. You think he looks happy? Yeah, he's kind of chubby, isn't he? Yeah. He says, I have something very special that belongs only to me. Do you have something? Very good. Yeah, look at that. He says, I was born with it. Look at that baby. Look at him. What's that called? He's showing us his butt. Oh, it's yeah. big, big, big joke, and then they will hide it. Exactly. He says here, sometimes I like to share my body by holding hands with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. That means to have it. Sometimes if I hold a baby's hands, I am sharing my body. Do you ever get the chance to hold a baby? Yeah. Do you have a baby? Yeah. My friend had to hold me because I was. Uh huh. So he was older than you, and he held your hands. Look at this one here. What do you think ha is happening in this picture? Yes, he says. Sometimes I feel like sharing my body by being tickled. His friend is tickling him right now. Do you like being tickled? Raise your hand if you like to be tickled. Like to be tickled? Like to be tickled? Sometimes. Okay. Okay. I have to tickle right now, though. I have to tickle right now. Does he still look happy in this picture? Yeah. Yeah, he still's got a smile. He says, even when I am sharing my body, it is always something special that belongs only to me. And how how does he look in this? Yeah. Looks sad. He says, sometimes I don't feel like sharing my body. Okay, let's stop the tickling. Let's read the rest of the book. If someone wants to touch me any place or way that makes me feel uncomfortable, I won't share my body. This is what I say. Don't touch me. I don't like it. Let's practice that for a second. Everyone stand up. And look me in the eyes. Put your important voices on, and we're going to say that one more time. You ready? Okay. One, one, two, three. Don't touch me. I don't like it. Excellent. That was great. Have a seat. That was super. How does he look now? Happy. He says, remember, your body is always something very special that belongs only to you. Who does your body belong to? Just to you. Who does your body belong to? your body belong to? Children will have a sense of body rights and responsibilities. In that book, um, It's My Body, that I read, 
course goes into that quite a bit. But they have a right to their own body, they have a right to say no to unwanted touch, um, and that they also have the right to not touch another person if they don't want to touch that other person. I'm sharing my body, I'm sharing my body. Got the message. I'm sharing my body, I'm sharing my body. Kids can sense that very quickly that you don't want to discuss certain topics, um, that you're uncomfortable with certain topics. And that in turn will make them uncomfortable about asking. So perhaps here's a third when they have a, a question, they won't come to you and ask you. Um, and I don't want that for my children, and I don't want that for the children I teach. I want them to know that I am someone they can approach with any kind of question. All right, so I, I, I show the whole video because I think the powerful part, even though it's old, is at the end, you can see it was a Head Start program. Um, but this notion of what she resources as curriculum tools, there are things that are really familiar to us. Um, and uh, I, there's a, the, Rochelle, there's, I, I, Ariel and I were actually going to redo this. She was going to get like six of her children and go through this to make it more updated. And, and then I moved and, uh, she left the program too, um, but I'm still going to like, I want to do an updated version of this, but the curriculum tool she pulls from, so I'm curious to like what you all wrote down, she uses dolls and puppets in the water table, you know, out of the water table, things that are familiar to them and non-threatening, but to make those connections and links around healthy sexual development. And then she brings a, her own baby in, just books and illustrations. The little boy says, the baby comes out of your mouth. She doesn't say, you're wrong, uh-uh. She doesn't look up and say, see, Beth, this is why we shouldn't be teaching these things. He is all wrong. Um, she just uses another child who has more knowledge and incorporates the correct language in and around where the baby actually comes out of the body at. And then this notion of drawing and creating. So think of those as four central curricular tools that are familiar to us and young children that we resource to actually teach and educate around healthy sexual development in this ongoing and continuous way, even starting in early childhood. Um, the other piece here around bodies, birth, and babies is if you notice when the group was smaller, how the engagement shifted opposed to when the group was larger. So think of small groups when we're thinking of this as engagement, intentionality, and how to integrate it into prior knowledge. Um, if this were a, uh, uh, circle time training, I would actually give you some data on like what should happen in circle time and what shouldn't based on 80% of the children or not. And then she responds to these incorrect statements with inquiry and curiosity, not with um, this bold right and wrong, which encourages children what to stay connected and to, you know, keep asking and keep talking. Because so, that's how she finds out what they know and what they don't know. And the beauty of this is it crosses these practices cross between homes and schools. Um, for, for all children. So we're, I'm, I'm looking at the time, Beth. So I think we're going to go three minutes over for everyone on here. We're going to just go three minutes over um, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So some of the handouts that you're going to get, you're going to get flushed in the classroom, how to handle sexual play. This is an article from the Children and Families Journal from Head Start years ago. I like it because it has this great chart inside that she created on page three. Um, this is something that uh, family child care providers, child care workers, Head Start staff, state preschool staff, managers, coordinators, college professors, social workers, counselors. Um, I really like this article because it's a great resource across um, type that's servicing young children. And then this is another resource from um, a program in Texas that actually stopped publishing the magazine that they would put out quarterly. Um, they stop right at the beginning of the pandemic. But this is really around exploring anatomy with young children. So when we go back to the dolls, um, around this notion of this isn't a dilemma, it's healthy development and really showing us how um, they did that. The third handout is about families are talking about normal childhood sexual development. And it really has some clear points inside the article for those who are always concerned that we can share with families, but we can actually share it with ourselves to kind of resource and get ideas around how to engage in positive, productive conversations with families in this ongoing way about uh, 
healthy childhood sexual uh, development. So I just wanted to, to let you know that those three are coming. And I just want to end. So yesterday we read the very old book that you saw her read to her children. So Robbie Harris actually has a new book out around who has what, who has what. Um, so I just want to end our session today um, with sharing this book with you all. And then Leah and I will pick um, five names from folk from yesterday and today, and you'll get an email um, because this is going to be the door prize for five random folk. So thank you all. Um, but I'm sure we have some folk from the library on here. This is a book we definitely can get into our libraries. Um, as I said, Robbie Harris is often on the band library book, but um, list, but we're uh, actively engaged people who know that books on the band book list are often books that are telling the truth about who we are and what we are. So, um, we don't think she should be on the list. So with that being said, thank you all um, for, for, for coming. And I'm going to end it with sharing a more updated version of what we read yesterday. Who has what? All about girls' bodies and boys' bodies. Thank you so much, Sean. This is such a great book. It looks awesome. Um, I had that one you shared yesterday of hers for my kids. And just I just left it when they were little. I left it on the table. And they just i and peruse a little bit or they're eating a snack. It was funny, but thank you so much, Sean. This is such a great training. I, I feel like it's just such an important topic and um, we should have more of them. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming. We appreciate it. Yes, we will be sending out the materials to you and links to the videos. And we look forward to, well, I won't see you at another training, but I'm sure Leah, we'll see you at other trainings. And Sean's going to be coming back um, every month through the rest of the fiscal year. So you'll be able to enjoy him some more. So Sean, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and a joy. And uh, as per usual, I'm going to ask those who can go ahead and click that leave button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And Sean and Leah and I will have a few minutes to debrief. Oh, this is so awesome. And then um, I got to get this book, actually. This is great. Um, and remember to go to your local bookstores. I love Amazon. And well, actually, I, I'll take that back. But sometimes that's what you got to use. But I, um, but there's wonderful, <laughs> there's wonderful bookstores that you can, local bookstores. So thanks, everybody, so much. And we'll uh, have a good, have a good weekend. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming and being here in these two days. Awesome.